our now monthly um, live session to answer some of the questions that are heavy on your mind and share a little bit about some of the initiatives that are, are gaining traction and underway here in the town. You've got uh, Josh Garrett here, uh, town council president in the middle of Main Street, dodging traffic uh, to, to help. Super, well, um, I wanna start off by introducing our guests. We've got Jill Pack, who is a longtime Zionsville resident and a member of our um, Zionsville Parks Board. And, um, and we have Maddie, Maddie, tell me your last name again. Miller. Miller, she has been an intern with our organization um, through IU's Resiliency Cohort, helping the both our, our parks director, um, our parks nature center director staff and the parks board to help bloom or help I, um, Zionsville join in on an effort that was started a year ago with a, um, a variety of uh, cities across Indiana. Um, we're playing a little bit of catch up, but we are working to really identify more about the stat, the, um, the status of our town as it relates to environmental indicators, where we fall with regard to our neighbors, so that you know we're not trying to look at a peer group that's in the north northeast or on the west coast. We're really a you know trying to um, compare where we are in terms of sustainability and environmental resilience according to those other communities here in Indiana. Um, super happy to have them on board today to share their work to share the, um, you know, the, the goals that we are undertaking in terms of participating in this effort and talk, talk about what comes next. So with that, we'll hand it right over to you all, Jill and, and Maddie. Great, Maddie, do you wanna do the presentation first? Yes, I can. Can everyone see my screen? Gotcha. Yes. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and listening to my presentation in this conversation about climate action planning. Um, my name is Maddie Miller. I am a graduate student at Indiana University. I'm studying um, public affairs and environmental science, and I've been interning through the resilience cohort at Indiana University to um, help Zionsville on this climate action planning process. So a brief primer on what climate action planning is. Um, a climate action plan or a CAP is a strategic plan that contains policies and programs that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address uh, climate vulnerabilities. So some of these strategies might have to do with residential energy, commercial energy, transportation, um, and we will have uh, surveys available on the website shortly, if not right now, that you can take. Um, to kind of give your opinion on which strategies Zionsville should implement to address greenhouse gas emissions. But these policies and programs will help us create cost saving strategies that will make Zionsville better adapted to changes in our climate and changes in our environment as the uh, climate continues to change. So uh, to start this climate action planning process, the town had to start with this milestone one of inventorying how much greenhouse gas is emitted by the town. And that was started, I think, in January of this year by the um, Nature Center here in Zionsville. And then the greenhouse gas inventory emissions were uh, finalized uh, for the year of 2018 this past May. <coughs> so from here, uh, we establish targets for where we want our emissions to go down by or uh, where, we where we want to address in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, then we develop a climate action plan itself. So we're sort of in this milestone two, three stage right now. So that greenhouse gas inventory that I was telling you about, um, this is it here. This shows um, how many uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalent is emitted by different facets of the town every year. In this particular year that we inventoried was 2018. So we could have the full year of data. Um, but as you can see, residential energy makes up 48% um, of our total inventory. 
And these emissions are contributed by um, the residential uh, homes and buildings in Zionsville, purchasing um, energy from companies that burn fossil fuels or using natural gas in their homes. And then that's followed by transportation and mobile sources. Transportation is our uh, vehicle fleet here in town and then residential owned vehicles and mobile sources uh, is uh, lawn equipment and other gas or fuel powered tools you might be using in your yard mostly. And that makes up 28% of our baseline emissions. And this is followed by our commercial energy sector. So that is uh, the gas, the gas is being emitted from the energy that's purchased by um, restaurants and businesses and that kind of thing here in town. And that makes up 19%. And that's followed by water and wastewater. It, um, emis it emits, um, the water treatment process emits uh, greenhouse gas. Um, so that's where that emission is coming from. And that's around 4%. And then solid waste, um, when things break down in landfills, it em emits CO2 and other uh, greenhouse gases. And that makes up around 1%. And this uh, process and fugitive emissions, which makes up a little less than 1% of Zionsville's greenhouse gas emissions stems from uh, industrial type equipment leaking and leaks and inefficiencies in those types of systems. And that doesn't make up a ton, but it is there a little less than 1%. And this totals to um, around 358,439 tons of CO2 equivalent emitted in 2018. So what I started doing at the beginning of my internship this summer is I took those baseline numbers and used a tool called ClearPath, which is what all the communities participating in this cohort have been using to um, document greenhouse gas emissions and make a plan to reduce them or curb them over time. And um, I took those numbers and I included the uh, projected population growth for the town of Zionsville and found that if nothing is done, if uh, the carbon intensity of these sectors does not change. And if Zionsville grows at the rate it's expected to grow, which is quite fast, then our greenhouse gas emissions as a town might double by the end of 2049. Um, the town of Zionsville might grow to over 56,000 people from 27,000 people in 2018. And um, that's because the Whitestown Zionsville area is actually one of the fastest growing suburban areas in the United States, which is kind of hard to believe, but um, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot we can do to make sure our emissions don't climb as high as they might according to these projections. But it's also important to note that these uh, increases here are uh, kind of a worst case scenario projection because surely um, as time goes on our um, energy system won't be as carbon intense as it is right now. And uh, we'll get access to more efficient vehicles and stuff over time. So this is more of a worst case scenario, but it is something to keep in mind going forward. And if anyone would like to learn more about this topic, um, you can go to the climate action plan video in surveys that are available on the Zionsville website. Um, this is the link you can go to, or you can go to the main <coughs> website and you can click on community and then click on climate action plan and you'll find everything there. There's a longer version of this presentation uh, with uh, the mayor and Mindy Murdoch from the uh, Nature Center um, explaining the project and talking about it along with myself. And if you have uh, specific questions or comments, you can also email cap at zionsville-in.gov and that's a line to reach us directly. Thank you so much, Maddie. That's really great information, very informative, and helps us understand a little bit more about the kinds of data that are being that's being collected, and how we compare with other, um, you know, with other jurisdictions. And I think most importantly, what the future looks like with regard to if we don't do anything, where that trajectory is taking us. I know that there there have been several. Um, really good questions asked with regard to this effort. And the, the first one is, so what? Why do we even want to know this information? What, what could we possibly do to have an impact on climate change? And I think that that's how all environmental um, issues 
start out. I, I mean, I can remember 35 years ago worried about trash growing um, and not having a place to go. So they were sending it out into the ocean. I could, um, I saw on the news in the evening and it frustrated with what, what do we do with that? How do we, how does any one community make a change? Um, and, and that's what led to uh, massive recycling programs and a lot of talks around how do we um, diminish waste and start to think for the long term. And it feels like that um, greenhouse gases is, an, is another one of those areas where we're starting to understand the impact that it has on our environment, on our natural environment, on our water, our air, and um, that with knowledge comes some power to make decisions, to understand what what maybe we could do. And, and as I looked at that data, it looks like 76% of the climate emissions that we're measuring are directly re related to the residents and the people that are here in the community. So if we start to, to make incremental changes um, as individuals, that that collective impact can be a positive force for diminished, you know, reducing our footprint for future generations. Part of that too, I think, is you know what you can, what you can't do, right? I mean, you got to be pragmatic about what is possible. And so, you know, to that point, Mayor, um, you know, maybe it's just you know making sure that Zionsville is easy to permit if you want um, solar panels on your house, right? And, and maybe it is yep. you know having having a little bit more density or sustainability in housing stock. So, you know, yeah. Zionsville is not going to be setting our own mileage standards, um, but you know, maybe right. there's preferred parking for electric cars, you know, if, yeah. if, if that proves to be environmentally sustainable because yeah. electricity still can be generated in dirty ways yeah. and the cars themselves, batteries can be um, environmentally challenging and making yeah. them. So it's kind of that ongoing discussion, but I think you're exactly right. I mean, it's got to start somewhere, right? And, and if right. it's going to start in small increments of individual communities, then we want to be a part of that discussion. Absolutely. And those are two really good examples, Josh. And I think that if we do it and then Whitestown does it and then, um, you know, Lebanon does it and all, and it just becomes this train of behavior change that shifts and one of us alone won't, won't really impact it. But as, as that growth continues and I, you know, I'd love to see Zionsville be an advocate, a leader. And I think being a part of this statewide study and um, that's that, that is intended to ch chart progress over a period of time gives us, um, the information to help us sort of see why this is important. And then also maybe down the road, look at how um, change can be, can be seen here and here locally. Jill, from the parks board perspective, what, if any, and I'm throwing you under the bus and putting you on the spot. So um, you can just make something up if you don't have, you know, if you weren't prepared for this, but what are, what do you feel like are some of the ways that um, the local government and in particular the parks department and maybe some other departments can um, positively impact the trajectory of climate change? Well, I think, <clears throat> excuse me for, for us, it's making sure that we are walking and bike friendly um, cities so that people, if they want to go out to dinner, aren't jumping in their car and driving downtown. Maybe they're riding a bike or walking downtown. Um, so you want to make sure that they're, it's accessible. So we, we need to continue to um, maintain and expand our trail system. Um, our park system is great. <clears throat> it continues to to you know, move forward and grow. I'm really looking forward to the Overly Warman Park, which um, is an, a new park for us that will be in, under construction next year. But, um, at, you know, that with the addition of planting trees, whether it's in the parks or in your yard, um, around your house to, to eliminate, you know, on really hot days, it'll keep it cooler, um, the shade will. Um, the trees just naturally give off oxygen, which is great, and they take in CO2. So it helps us incrementally. Um, but we have to start out with, with baby steps, I think, just generally. We can't just be like, 
we are all going to be 100% carbon free next year. It's like, you know, let's change small behaviors. And it's a behavior change. People, it takes people time to make the change. Um, so that's kind of my thought on it. I'm, I'm really excited that we're doing this project and that we're learning this information. And it's now then we just need to next move forward to involving the community through virtual meetings, et cetera, due to the pandemic, um, to put together what is it our, what are our strategies? How are we going to do this? What's going to get you to put your butt on your bicycle and ride someplace versus getting in the car or putting your child on a bus versus driving them to school? <clears throat> it just, every little thing will add up and it's a process that will take years to take, you know, to come to fruition, but still we need to start now. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all both both for your work and everyone else who's working on this project behind the scenes. And we look forward to hearing more as you continue to get into the community. And Josh, I'm ready for that solar ordinance. Um, let it, and that way maybe our subdivisions will that have those things um, put into our covenants might might think differently about it if we're acting as a town. I think that yeah. would be a terrific thing. Well, we can we can work together on that. I have solar panels and awesome. I love them. I mean, my electric bill goes down, so it's great. Sweet. Awesome. I'm themselves. putting solar on. I'm putting solar on next month. So very excited. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, and I do. You know, I know that when I um, when I first moved here, I felt like the 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 tagline for Zionsville was a town within a park, and um, that we were known for being a tree city, and um, I. I'd love for us to have some real um, pro high profile tree planting efforts that we um, kind of resume for maybe what we used to do in the past. Absolutely. Tree USA. Yeah. That is science film. What's up? What's the next, what's the next question up for us? I think it's okay. on mosquitoes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I can read that one if you want. Yeah. I can, I can summarize it basically. Um, yeah. this, this person sent, sent an article over and, and basically had concerns about the various mosquito companies um, and what impact they have on spraying for um, you know, the, the environment, for um, neighbors, uh, you know, based on chemicals they use and, and what, if anything, can be done from a, from a legislative standpoint um, about them uh, as well. And, and full disclosure, I, I am a user of their services and have been um, happy with the results as I can now use my back, uh, backyard. Uh, but I certainly understand people's concerns around it, the spraying green. Yeah, yeah, I think we've got it. You know, we do have a permitting process and some of these things are really governed by the state and by, um, you know, business, the, the, the rights for free enterprise and, and also for individuals to be able to control what happens on their property. So there's, there's probably not going to be any, any state or townwide effort to limit um, one particular pest control um, company. I think that it, it's great to have dialogues within your HOA just to understand each other better and to understand concerns. I think that it, the more we talk as a community about what, what we're, um, you know, what, what, how each of our, our choices are maybe encroach on each other and try to have some civil dialogue around that is a, is a win for humanity when we can do that. But I, I, I think it's important that for those who may feel like um, the mosquito situation and the spray is damaging, um, that they have concerns about it. There are also people who are concerned about um, the diseases that mosquitoes uh, carry or even just the, the allergic reaction, the impact that mosquitoes have on their um, their families, so there's there's two sides to every coin in conversation, and it 
it doesn't all need to be cured by government um, action. It probably makes sense to just keep talking and kind of understand each other a little bit better on these, these issues. One, one thing too, as, as we were sort of talking through this was, and this is related to, to the presentation that Maddie made in terms of climate change and, and CO2 emissions is that, you know, as the, as, as the country, as the world warms and winters are less severe, you know, that can make mosquitoes even worse. And so, um, you know, is, is there are natural ways to control mosquitoes. Is there's other ways. I mean, I think education is always a great thing. You know, we, we spray because it's cheap, easy, and convenient, right? And that's kind of the unfortunate reality of it. If there are other things that can be done um, that can avoid that, mitigate that, lessen the need, and I think people are interested in learning those things too. That's true. Yeah, let's find a better mousetrap, so to speak. Exactly. Okay, so um, another question came in about is it is it possible that increasing um, allowing more battery powder powered golf court cart access um, would help us decrease our greenhouse emissions from cars? Um, probably. I think that we have to, as with everything, there's a balance between public safety and um, and and you know what gets to what travels on our cars. Jill made a really good po point right out of the gate that clearly bike riding and walking are going to be your least, um, you know, your, your lightest footprint as it relates to uh, carbon emissions when we're traveling around. Um, but right now, I think that the, where the golf carts are able to, to uh, move us around it is um, adequate. We're not a resort community. We're not, um, you know, we're, 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 even though we're a town, we're a pretty big um, operation and our roads are, are uh, challenging enough without adding additional um, recreational um, activities to the mix. Um, I, was, I was talking to Councillor Plunkett about this issue last week um, and I asked him how many people had registered their golf carts. I think he told me it was like 15. So there's 15 registered golf carts in Zionsville. And, and I know we get this question a lot. And, and so there must be more demand than that. Um, so, you know, getting people to register so we understand what the demand is, is, is important. I mean, you need to register to be on those roads. You know, and I think we've talked about this before. The, the ordinance is kind of living and breathing in something that we're always looking at. You know, should this road be added? Should this road be removed? Um, you know, things like that. And so... You know, from from our perspective, it's something that, that we're continuing to, um, to to look at and to evolve. You know, it, 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 and, and this is where I think things get confusing, right? You know, is a golf cart that is electric powered but is fired by a coal plant and uses batteries that can be ex harmful to the environment? Is that more efficient than a car? And I don't know, right? I mean, I really don't. Um, so trying to figure out all of those nuances, and then if you add solar in the mix, does that make it better? Probably, but it's a very complicated issue that, that um, is hard to understand, at least for me. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think we've had, I, I'm looking for something that's a new question. I know there's a question about um, sort of the impact of, of this was a reference to uh, a, a, a video that was sent to us and it was referencing the impact of, of um, solar and wind on sort of birds and bats and turtles and things like that. Yeah, and I didn't watch the video, so I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss. I, I mean, I can, I can talk through it. I mean, basically the, 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 the summary of it was that we shouldn't consider renewables as viable because of the impact to the environment, ironically, from, from a birds and a bats and a, and a turtle standpoint. Um, so it was put out by this, this organization called Prager University or, or yeah, Prager University. Um, so I'll kind of talk about two things about that. In, in watching the video, they didn't have any alternatives. It was, this is bad, 
but I guess the alternative is just keep going with the status quo, which I think is worse. Um, and, and, you know, I think there is a realization that, that wind and solar, you know, in, in scale can have some, some impact to the environment. And I think it's, it's trying to figure out a way to mitigate that. Um, I, I think the bigger, the bigger thing here is, all right, so, so here's a video that says, don't do it. What's, what's their, What's the purpose behind that video, right? And so in, in looking up Prager University, it's not a university. It's not an accredited yeah, academic heard. institution. So it's kind of weird to me that you can just call yourself a university. Like I'm gonna call yeah. I'm gonna hear a university. As someone that's sending of, people to universities and colleges and spending lots of money, that one never <laughs> anybody's radar. Yeah, yeah and, and you can't send them to Prager U because there's no certifications or diplomas. Um, so I was kind of curious about them, like, who are they, you know, and, and so I did some, some of my own research and, and they are a extreme right wing, um, uh, they came up as extreme right wing bias, promotion of propaganda, use of force sources with failed fact checks and publishing misleading information on immigration and climate change. So um, I think that really goes to the conversation about, you know, you as an individual have some responsibility to do your own research on any topic, right? And, and you shouldn't trust Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or, or me, or right? Like do, Emily, right. <laughs> right? I mean, do, do your own research on a topic and, and form your opinion on that. And we may have different opinions on it, right? I mean, I, I will tell you that I firmly believe that climate change is real, it is caused by humans, and that is based on the opinion of my own research and scientists that, that I have read about. Um, you may not have the same opinion, but, but I again, will encourage you to do your own research. And, and if we don't have the same opinion, hopefully we can have a civil conversation about it. Um, you know, that seems to be lacking these days, at least at the national level. Um, it's not a personal insult if we disagree. Um, but just, you know, yeah. treat everything you see in the news with skepticism. There's an agenda going on there based on who's funding. Um, don't trust the media. Don't trust politicians like us. I mean, do your own research and, and be informed. Yeah, for sure. Ditto what he said. Let's see. Can you can a list be provided of black owned businesses in the village and surrounding Boone County area? Um, I, so we are preparing a list of women and minority owned businesses to share on the website. I think um, I think that you want to keep doing your own due diligence too and um, talk to people about who you're, who, what underrepresented um, businesses your friends are using, your colleagues, and um, share when you have a good experience in, um, in, in any business in Zionsville, frankly, but certainly in those that, that, that may be underrepresented. Don't know that we have, I think everything else was just really a repeat of what we've already addressed. Uh, there was one question about the solar co-op program and oh, net okay. metering and, and fees and the costs and things to, to do that. Um, and any competition there is for that. <coughs> Did well, we Zach Shaw is the, the Indiana director for <coughs> the Solar United Neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah neighbors. Got it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am a member of the, it's a joint Hamilton Boone County co-op. Um, and what the co-op itself is trying to do is to make it easier to get solar installed. Um, so it, it basically, you don't have to go out and get six or seven bids. They talk to six or seven contractors who give them pricing generally um, and talk about what their equipment will be, what their warranties are, and all, all the things that you might consider. And then all of those companies are looked at and reviewed, and one is chosen by a committee that is part of the co-op. <clears throat> and then that company will come out and give you a bid um, of what it will cost to put solar on your house. And it's based on what your annualized usage is, um, historically, uh, so that they're making sure that they're providing sufficient panels. 
um, you don't have to do anything. It doesn't cost anything to join the co-op. It does not, you aren't required to put solar on your house. It's just an easy way for you to get a, a bid and you do have a chance then of getting, you know, a, a lower bid based on just economies of scale. You know, mm -hmm. if, if there's 50 people in the co-op and 20 put on solar with this one company, they might be willing to give you a cost break. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically what it is. With net metering, Zionsville basically has two companies that provide our electricity. One is Duke Energy and the other is Boone REMC. And so two years ago, the Senate passed Senate Bill 309, which ended net metering <clears throat> with a certain, <clears throat> if you were done by the end of that year, you were grandfathered in for a long period of time and it decreased over time. It's so that as years go by, if, if you decide to put solar on this year and you're a Duke customer, your net metering is, is diminished, the length of time. And what that means is if you pay 10 cents for a kilowatt hour and you have excess, you've generated excess energy, they'll pay, pay you 10 cents for that to go back onto their grid. Um, what they're trying to do is, is they want to reduce that and not pay you what you would pay, but pay you the, the wholesale rate. So it's a lower rate that you're going to get back. Um, that did not apply to Boone REMC because it is a co-op. And so <clears throat> currently Boone REMC is paying one for one. They're, they're doing that metering at a one for one basis. We don't know how long that will continue because it's a co-op. And so it will depend on what the members of that co-op should, the board should choose to vote for. Um, it could, they could reduce it at any time. And they do charge a monthly fee, I think is $15 for, um, to go solar because they have to change out your meter and it's a different billing process that you go through. So that's their reasoning for charging that. I don't know if Duke does something similar or not. I just know that, uh, cause I'm on Boone REMC. So I know that they do. And there are lots of companies out there putting solar on residential houses. Um, so there's a variety of places you could look if you're not part of a co-op. That's helpful information to understand that, that you really do need to think about the full um, you know, supply chain of electricity as you're considering making a change in how you get power, um, switching to solar, that there's a relationship with the, the energy, your current electricity provider and um, that, you know, there's also a federal investment tax credit, I think, if yeah. you invest in solar, <clears throat> solar um, panels and just the, you know, there, there's just a lot of different components. So it probably makes sense if you're thinking about doing this to really sit down and plan out the full, um, you know, the full process and think through your costs and what, you know, after it's all implemented, what you might be looking at. Yeah. And, that's, and that if you're in Zionsville, you've got two different um, energy companies that you're going to need to to work with to think through yeah. how to make that do that calculation. Yeah, and so in, in, unless you are going to be truly off the grid and have battery space to store all that electrical electricity that you're sending back to the grid, which almost no one does, you're going to be dealing with somebody from Duke or Boone R EMC. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that's an interesting. It sort of brings things full circle. We sort of started about, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we making this aware? You know, what can we do? And, you know, what can individual citizens do? I mean, you think about, you know, Jill, you mentioned that Senate bill. You know, one other thing that happened this past legislative session I was very disappointed in was the our House of Representatives, the state House of Representatives passed House Bill 1414. And what that bill basically said was that if a if a utility wants to shut down a coal plant because it's no longer efficient, and these plants are getting less and less efficient uh, because of how cheap it is getting to do renewables. Mm -hmm. They now have to go through an extra review process through the IU, I think it's the Indiana uh, Regulatory IURC. Commission, yeah. the IURC, um, which is a, you know, it is a political body that can be used to force utilities to keep inefficient and environmentally destructive plants open that you and I pay for. 
Right. So even just paying attention to this stuff and contacting your legislators and voting for people that think the way that you want to think after you've done your own research, I mean, that's just as important, right? Because otherwise we're going to be stuck with dinosaur coal plants that are spewing out CO2 emissions, regardless of what we're doing locally. And you've got a, a political group that's standing in the way. And there's, in, there's interests, coal industry, that, that wants to keep those things open. So this transition will go kicking and screaming. It will not go smoothly and vote. Right. Every change in technology, there has been winners and losers, and the and the and the you know the the constituency groups that support those that are are going out of style are strong, and they always have these last gasp efforts. And it, it is, you know, it, it for us to have a Zionsville that looks as beautiful as it does today, a hundred years from now. This we have to make the choices that are going to help ensure that. Absolutely. Well, it's a, it's been a delightful conversation. I think um, there's a couple of little other topics I want to make sure that we that we share with you today. Today, um, some of our talented neighbors, um, Mike Howenstein and Terry, um, have in, have installed a new edition of the. Um, the Reading Railroad, really. Our little free library for um, Zionsville has been added here at Town Hall. You can access it via the trail or via our parking lot. It's right in the, the breezeway courtyard that's, that's to the side of Town Hall. It is giant. It's double the size of many of the others you'll see around town. And it is modeled after Zionsville's own inner urban rail car system. So when you're out and about, come and check it out. It's filled with books and um, ready for, it's even got a sanitizing station associated oh. with it. So Full service. <laughs> we're thinking of all the things. Um, come out and take a look at that and help um, thank Terry McCain and Mike for the work that they've done. They put together a spectacular product and they've in they installed the whole thing. It's just, it's just really fantastic. Um, we are, can, many of you have received surveys with regard to our implicit bias and community conversation around racial and social justice. Excited to see the number of, of our, not excited but not surprised to see the number of residents who are interested in participating in these events, these conversations. Um, can, if you haven't received yours, please reach out to, um, reach out to me, reach out to Amanda Vila. Um, we'll make sure that you, our, our chief spheres, we'll make sure that you get that information so that you can take a, take a look at the topics and choose what really resonates with you and your family. Um, and we'll get those launched here in the next, um, you know, the, the next couple of few weeks. Um, the Gateway Development Project. That's another piece, another thing that is a community development effort that is coming up soon that I wanna make sure that you know, have information about and know that it's coming. We are, um, you, it's seen that we've removed a couple of unsightly buildings from the village business district. And now what? So we're, we're really looking to engage the community, both business owners and residents, stakeholders, to get a sense of what does the town of Zionsville see for that blighted entryway to our community? How do we take the underdeveloped um, a property, a broken pavement and transform it into something that really represents the heart of our community, the aspirations of our community, put it to work, not just from an economic standpoint, but also from a community development standpoint. How do we, um, look for ways to build infrastructure that will last and meet the community's needs for a long time into the future. And I look forward to working with Josh and council and um, all the other in interested parties in envisioning what that looks like and then sharing that vision with the development community so that they can start to bring their best ideas forward for us. And, and this was something I think, Mayor, that bubbled up after Sycamore Flats, 
where people wanted to be engaged and we wanted to be fair to developers coming in and saying, this is what we want. I, I, you know, not everyone will agree this is what we want, but this is what the majority of, of, they want, of, of the community wants. And so I'm appreciative of, of you taking the lead on this. And, and um, I think this will be a really good process and, and I'm, I'm excited about what might come out of it. Me too. And I think what, you know, what I encourage everyone to think about is, you know, when, when your family sits down and takes a look at the income you bring in and all the expenses that you have as a family, you, you don't pick ice cream and vacations as the main part of what you're spending your dollars on. We all have to sort of measure out what is the economic value of, um, of land to a community and how do you derive the highest and best use of that of that um, property for the community and recognize that we're going to look for um, opportunities to really build our community stronger and look for um, customers and um, vitality in our business district so that it, that the community business community residential community we, that we all thrive moving forward. Um, I'm excited about how that translates into some new amenities and some new infrastructure in the Village Business District. Although my kids have spent an awful lot of money at Bubs, The Scoop, and Dairy Queen this summer, so it may be a top five expense. It's true, it's so true. Dairy Queen is a big draw for us too. <laughs> Yeah, that's all, that's all I've got. I don't know if anyone else, Amanda, has anything else popped up as we've been chatting? Wear your masks. Don't forget oh, the mask yeah. mandate. Um, you know, How many, that... I mean, I've got like masks everywhere. There uh, are, you know, cars in the, at every pocketbook, um, found one in the back pocket of a pair of jeans, like they're all over the place. And, and again, like I'm going to go a theme here. Do your research, right? I mean, there's research coming out that, I mean, the masks, they work. They cut down on transmission. It depends on what kind of mask that you use. Um, that can have an impact. Um, in fact, I saw a story from back in 1918 where they were telling people to wear a mask. And so uh, that was back during the Spanish flu. So, um, you know, it's something that, you know, it's, it's, we had a campaign of why do you wear a mask, right? And, and yeah. you know, you do it for others, right? It's, it's, right. It's a, it is an act of unselfishness to do it even if like you don't want to right so appreciate right. appreciate right. people to do that yeah and you know this is how you cover your whole like all the way over here and under there this is not your mask isn't right doing that. So, uh, i saw a video of someone that had cut a hole in their mask and they were eating <laughs> through it it's like well <laughs> it's convenient but not really the point i know i know all right well, you know, it's been a crazy year, 2020. Yeah, yeah. Home stretch. <laughs> We're over the hump. <laughs> We're on the down. That's it. Yeah. On the Jill, thanks for joining. Maddie, thanks for that presentation. That was really helpful. It was terrific. We really appreciate you, but you both, the work that you're doing and sharing it with the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks for including us. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Good one. See ya. Bye.